We're going to continue to worship the Lord this morning with our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. And I want to take just a quick minute to brag on our kids' ministry here. Uh, I'm heading to the west side of the state right after church day with my family. And uh, so I told my wife, she was not serving in kids today. I said, hey, since you're not serving today, why don't you just stay home, finish packing, not feel stressed out. And then you guys can just come to the second service and we'll take off after church. And my kids were like, no. Like my kids, they demand to be at both services every single Sunday. And so as a pastor, that's really cool for me because a lot of times they're here whether they want to be or not because we are here. Uh, so to know that uh, Jared, who leads up the kids' ministry and the different room coaches and every volunteer that's a part of the team that's serving in there, they're creating a place where when my kids don't have to come to church, they are demanding that we take them to church. So that is really awesome. So thank you to every single person that's involved in kids' ministry. I'm so grateful for that and the fact that you are helping instill an unshakable faith in our children. Uh, it's just beyond... Uh, no parent could ever express how meaningful that really is to us. So thank you for that. And we as a church, uh, we invest heavily. Yay! Our kids' people love it. <laughs> so we as a church, we invest heavily with our people, resources, time, energy, and finances because we believe in investing in our kids. They are a precious gift that God has given us, and we want to be a part of seeing Jesus do something great in their generation. So thank you for your generosity so that we can continue to create awesome environments for our kids to learn about Jesus and his love for them so faith can be built inside of them. So Jesus, as we give back to you this morning, we recognize that you have first given to us. And we pray specifically this morning for our children. God, we thank you for every kid's worker and for just investing in them and a part of that team. Jesus, we pray that you would honor that and that we would see unshakable faith in our children, that we'd see you do even more in their day and in their generation than we see you do in ours. And Jesus, thank you for every person that gives and enables us to do that. Jesus, we pray every dollar we invest in our kids' ministry would bear a miraculous return on it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, if you're our guest this morning, thank you so much for being here. We are so honored that you chose to be here with us. We would love to know that you were here. So in the seat backs in front of you, we have some communication cards. We'd love to have you fill one of those out, and you can turn it in at Guest Central, which will be just through the doors as you exit the auditorium. We have a little gift bag for you uh, and let's, to be able to properly greet you and answer any questions that you might have about the church. Also, coming up next Sunday, we have our big give offering. I'm actually going to invite my friend uh, Nina to the stage, who is... Uh, I I almost said president again. She's not the president of Ford ELC, but she should be. She is the principal of Ford ELC, which maybe says something about how my relationship with my principals were <laughs> as a kid. President. And president. And uh, some of you know, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, we are doing a big give, which is we are going to raise $20,000 or hopefully even more than that. And with that, we will be able to buy new boots for every single kid in her school and be able to buy some gifts for the teachers and throw a party for them. And it's just going to be awesome. And we're really excited about that. But we invited Nina here this morning so that she can share a little bit about what the students and families are like at her school and why it's important that we support them. So Nina, thank you for being here today. And could you share a little, oh, where's your microphone? I'm sorry. Now, Chris, can you grab that mic for her real quick? Sorry, I forgot. My, I had like one job. I had one job. Uh, can you just share with us a little bit about what, the, what the, the families and students are like in your school? Sure. So Ford Early Learning Center um, serves about 360 um, pre-K, so um, two and a half year olds through first graders, so seven and eight year olds. Um, and in that process of serving them, these students come from a very challenging environment. Um, we have about 30 students in our, in our building right now that are homeless or doubled up. Um, I've seen doubled up situations where it's as many as um, eight to 10 people living in a one bedroom apartment. Um, so kids are sleeping on the floor without beds, things like that. Um, some of the other things that needs of our kids, they come from very low income, we have free breakfast and free lunch for all of our students. And oftentimes, for many of our students, that's the only meals they get in a day. I've t gone on home visits and taken students home. And I remember one particular student, I took them home. And they were all excited because they got home and mom had bought a box of cereal for dinner. And um, in further talking with the student over the next few days, they didn't usually have dinner. So to have a box of cereal was a big deal for them. Many of our students come with no clothes. I shouldn't say no clothes. They do come dressed. <laughs> but they come improperly dressed. 
So I was saying during the last service that on Friday when we had our first snow, um, I had a little girl come in in capris and flip-flops. Um, oftentimes their winter coats are a sweat jacket with a hood. Um, we do a lot of trying to provide. My staff is amazing. Um, we are a family at Ford, and we have a very amazing staff that go above and beyond to try and meet the needs of these students. Um, and to really just show them love and grace and mercy without being able to share all of that with them, but through what we do. And so we're always looking for ways to help them um, with food, with clothes, with all of those things. Yeah. Um, so with us being able to, to partner with you to get uh, some good winter boots for the children, what kind of a difference will that make in them? I think the whole idea of being able to give them boots it's, it's meeting that basic need that they have. Our job as educators is to teach them academics, to teach them math and reading. But when they're coming to school hungry and cold, and they're going out on the playground in flip-flops or not going out because they have flip-flops on and it's too cold, we can't, we can't expect them to learn unless we're meeting those basic needs. And so by you guys being able to provide those boots for them, I know that all of my students will have warm feet, that will be able to get through a winter without getting sick or being exposed to things that they shouldn't be exposed to at five and six years old. Yeah, so if, if we don't do this, will anybody else do it? No, <laughs> there, we, we have worked really hard to try and get them things. Boots has always been an issue. We often get coats donated. Um, we get a handful of coats donated every year, and it's always a challenge to decide who gets the coats. Um, this year, our donation of coats, we have 15 coats, and we have 360 students, and we probably have 200 of them that don't have winter coats. We have, you know, boots we never get. Um, once in a while, we'll find a pair of boots when we're at the thrift store, when we're, you know, when we're out shopping as staff, my teachers, if they have a student they know is a big need, they'll try and do it. But it's a real challenge when you have you know, a class of 26 kids and they all need something. And so without the support of you guys, a lot of our kids would go without this winter. Yeah. Was there anything else you want to say? I just want to say thank you. Um, Radiant's done so much for our building already, and our students are so aware of it. Um, this summer, right around the time when school started, you guys came in and you did all sorts of amazing things, sandboxes and buddy benches and our courtyard, and our students noticed that, and every day they're, they're on those benches and they're in the sandbox, and it's just a way to really help give them an understanding of the fact that they're loved, and I just really appreciate that. I went into this position because I wanted to serve these kids and I want to be a missionary to these students in, in every way that I can, but I couldn't do it without the support of churches and organizations. So I do really appreciate everything that you guys have done. Yeah, well, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be able to do that. We're going to pray over Nina. We guys just want to extend your hands towards her and let's, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for Nina. And God, thank you that you have called her specifically to the school. Jesus, thank you for the heart that she has to be a missionary to each and every one of these children. And God, I pray that through the work that you're doing through her and through every one of the faculty members, that every one of these kids know how loved, how valued, and how much dignity each and every one of them possesses. Jesus, we pray for wisdom, uh, for divine strategies. God, we pray for patience and for peace. Jesus, we pray for provision. And God, we are so grateful for this opportunity that we have to partner with Nina and with the school. And Jesus, we pray that through what we do, you would be glorified and that children would be loved. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And let's, let's give her a big hand as she goes back to her seat. Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 9. Uh, we're taking a little bit of a break from our series through Acts because... Um, I wanted to teach on this idea uh, as we're, we're getting ready to give for the Big Give offering, which is going to be next Sunday. And like I said, we're, gonna, we're going for $20,000, and after hearing her speak, I think, man, we should have made that a lot larger goal. Uh, with that money, we'll be able to buy boots for everybody, but it sounds like there's a lot more need for food and for coats and other things like that as well. So we'll be able to start with the boots, and as more funds are given, we will buy more and more stuff to meet more and more of the needs for them. Does that sound good to all of you? 
Awesome. And then also, you can sign up if you want to volunteer on December 6th. We will be in the school. We will have personal shoppers. So if you want to be able to help a kid shop, what you will do is you'll go around and help them find the clothing that they like, that looks good to them, and that fits them properly, be able to make them feel loved and valued, get them to laugh a little bit, just show them how awesome they are. So you can sign up to do that. Uh, the night before, I think we're going to be in there doing some decorating. So I'd encourage you, if you can help in any way with setting up, tearing down, being a personal shopper, go to RadiantA2.com on the events page, and you can sign up to be a part of the big gift. But every single one of us can give towards it as well. So what I want you to do is this week be praying about what it is that God would have you give, and then next week we'll take up the offering at the end of the service, as well as you'll be able to give online if that's the way that you choose to give, and you can designate it for the big gift. Now, in Luke chapter 9, the reason that I'm, I'm having us go there this week is because I believe in Luke chapter 9, you see a demonstration of what I think is the full gospel. And the full gospel, uh, if you've been in the church world much, the full gospel means something. It means that it's the kind of church where everybody's going to be like running up and down the aisles and screaming like you haven't had church till 20 people are laid out on the ground in front and maybe some snakes involved. Like it's kind of a weird connotation as I discovered being a Methodist kid that went to visit a full gospel church once. Uh, but as, as it relates to the message of Jesus Christ, remember the message of Jesus is the gospel. A gospel means a proclamation of good news that changes reality forever. So the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ is that our Messiah has come, that he has saved us from our sins, that his kingdom has come into the earth, and now we're called to repentance and to follow after him, to become a disciple of Jesus, and then to begin to make disciples of Jesus. That's what a lot of us, when we think about the gospel, that's where our mind automatically goes, is it's this proclamation of the good news of Jesus and everything that he's done. And humans are polar creatures. If you've noticed in politics, have you ever noticed that there's not a single party that actually addresses societal issues across the board? Every party has the thing that they think is the biggest problem, and so they just really focus on that. And then what happens is if you happen to think that that happens to be the biggest problem and they have the right solution, you become a member of that party. Your party's the right party about everything. The other parties, like I say parties like there's more than two parties. Yeah. Uh, so the other party becomes the enemy, and they're wrong about everything. And we're polar in that, so we just gravitate towards some things and neglect everything else, or we begin to believe that the people who think and feel just like us are the ones that have it figured out and everybody else is the enemy. That sums up American politics right there. Like, thank you, Jesus, that we can watch football without political commercials for another couple months. But it's not just in politics that we're that way. It's every area of life. And that even includes the gospel of Jesus Christ. A lot of us, when we come to the gospel, there's kind of two opposite, uh, not two opposite, but there's two different poles that we tend to gravitate towards. The first is like I was talking about, the gospel is proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And so we put all of our time and our attention and focus into proclaiming and proclaiming and calling people to repentance. And that's a good thing to do. But then you can neglect this other aspect, which is then the expression of the heart of God, which is also a part of the gospel, meeting the tangible needs of others, demonstrating how God loves and values and provides for people. But then on the other side, there's a lot of people who, when they think of the gospel, they think the gospel is really just uh, don't worry about proclaiming, don't worry about calling people to repentance. Like, let's just focus on demonstrating love to people. And that's a good thing to do, but it in itself is incomplete. The full gospel is this full expression of the heart and of the work of God in our world. It includes both proclamation of the good news that Jesus has come, that we put our faith in him and by such we are saved and we're to go and to tell other people and call people to repentance, but it's also then finding the needs that are around us and meeting those needs and in doing so demonstrating the heart of God. We can't just focus on one of these things to the exclusion of the other, which is what we tend to do. We have have to understand that the full gospel that God has called us to live out is proclamation of the king as well as demonstration of his kingdom. And Jesus demonstrates this for us so perfectly in Luke chapter 9. And that's why I call it the full gospel chapter. And it says in Luke chapter 9 verses 1 and 2 and then verse 6, and he called the twelve together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And then in verse 6, and they departed and went through the villages preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. 
Now, this is part of what we were talking about in the last two weeks in the beginning of Acts, is that the baptism with the Holy Spirit gives us supernatural power to be able to go out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message that Jesus is the Messiah that's been awaited for, that he died, was raised again, call people to repentance and put their hope and faith in him for salvation and his return and the fullness of his kingdom being restored and every wrong made right, every tear being dried, death and sin being put away once and for all. That's the hope that we have. That's the message that we proclaim. And that's what Jesus has sent the disciples out to do. So they go out there, they do that, and then in verses 10 through 17, it says, when the apostles returned, they told Jesus everything they had done. Like, Jesus, like, we cast out demons, and we heal people, and we call people to repentance, and people put their, like, their, like, the kingdom is coming, it's advancing, it was awesome, they're all excited about it. And then it says, then he slipped quietly away with them toward the town of Beth- Bethsaida, but the crowds found out where he was going, and they followed him. He welcomed them and taught them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who were sick. Late in the afternoon, the twelve disciples came to him and said, Send the crowds away to the nearby villages and farms so they can find food and lodging for the night. There is nothing to eat here in this remote place. But Jesus said, You feed them. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Or are you expecting us to go and to buy enough food for this whole crowd? For there were about 5,000 men there. Jesus replied, Tell them to sit down in groups of about 50 each. And so the people all sat down, and Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up toward heaven, and blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread and fish to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. See what Jesus does in this? Is he demonstrates the gospel, the heart of God, so fully and so perfectly. When the crowds come to him, he doesn't cast them away. The crowds come to him, and it says that he begins to, he he welcomes them first. He's trying to get away. He's trying to rest up. He's a busy guy. He's pouring himself out. He's tired. He wants to get away for a little bit. But the crowds, they come, and they find him, and his heart is so filled with love for them that he welcomes them. And then he begins to teach them about the kingdom of God. He's calling them to repentance, training them and equipping them for how they're supposed to live. He's healing the sick. Like those are all things that a lot of us get really excited about. But then, after this has been going on all day, Jesus is, you know, proclaiming the gospel. The disciples come up to him and like, hey, Jesus, we got a problem. Like it's getting late. We got to send them home because all these people, they're hungry and uh, so we, like, we got to get rid of all these hungry people. Like, that's how compassionate we are. I'm so moved with love for people. I'm going to send them all away. Like, go find food, little birds. And so Jesus says, no, that's not the full expression of the gospel. Jesus says, I want you to feed them. Like, what? You want us to feed them? Jesus, we have five loaves and two fish. And he's like, yeah. Let's feed these people. And then this is what Jesus does. He not only proclaims the gospel message and calls people to repentance, but he then demonstrates his heart for providing and loving and caring for his children. Now, this is so key to what the gospel is. It's a, it's a proclamation of the good news of our king and of salvation and the hope that we have, but it's also this demonstration of the good, good heart of our father that loves his children, that doesn't send them away, that is provision for them, he's protection for them, he meets the needs of his children. Like, how good of a dad would I be if my kids come and they're like, Dad, I'm hungry. I'm like, well, get thee to another village child and buy thyself some food. But that's a bad, bad father. No, like what I'm supposed to do as a father is to meet the needs of my kids. When they're hungry, I feed them. When they're naked, I clothe them. When they're thirsty, I give them something to drink. When they're crying, I comfort them. Those are the things that a father does. And that's the things that our heavenly father does even more so than any of us as earthly parents could ever do for our children. If we really want to take hold of what it means to live out the gospel, to make disciples and show the world how beautiful the gospel is so that they come in and make a decision to follow after Jesus themselves, it has to be the full gospel that we present to people. 
It has to be proclamation of the message, but it also has to be demonstration of the heart of our Father, which is what we see Jesus doing here. And so if we want to live out this demonstration of the heart of our Father, it starts with compassion. When the crowds came to Jesus, he had compassion on them. Over and over again, through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what you'll see is Jesus sees the crowds, he sees their needs, and it actually says, and he was moved with compassion for them, or he was filled with mercy for them. He was brokenhearted for them. One time it says that he looked at the crowds and he saw them as they were like sheep without a shepherd. They needed someone that was going to be the one who led them and comforted them and cared for them and provided for them. Jesus was filled with compassion for his people. And it's what led him then to be the one who met their needs. But this is what the disciples did. Is the disciples, when they saw the crowds, they saw an obstacle that had to be removed. Like all of these hungry people, there's this huge need. So like, let's just get rid of it. And that can be the natural reaction to our hearts when we see need around us. It's like, well, like, let's send them off to someone else. Like, there's got to be some agency that can take care of them somewhere. You know, they just got to, like, pick themselves up by the bootstraps and provide for themselves. Let's just get them out of here. You know, one of my favorite things about this church is that every single time I drive up the driveway and every time you all come here on Sundays is you see the tents of the homeless that are in our city that are camped around this area behind Kroger, behind our areas. A lot of people would say that's a blight, that's something we don't want people to see. No, I thank Jesus that every single time I come here, I'm confronted with the fact that there are great needs in our city and they are that close to me. I'm confronted with the fact that I have been unduly blessed in my life, that God has poured out provision over me. He poured out parents. He, he poured out like just like, my life is just blessing after blessing after blessing that I didn't create for myself. It was just blessing that I walked into and that Jesus poured out on me. I am so grateful for that. And I never want to lose sight of the fact that I have been so blessed and that there are people who are so close to me that are so broken and have so much need in their life. I don't ever want to forget that. I don't ever want to lose sight of that. Our human tendency is like, let's get rid of it. Let's pretend like we don't see it. One of the things about wealth that's so dangerous for us, and we are rich, the vast, vast majority of you in this room are filthy, stinking rich. Like, no, that's the thing about rich people is none of us think we're rich. Because we're always comparing ourselves to like Bill Gates. Like, well, I'm not rich. You know, I'm not like Bill Gates rich. Well, yeah, but if your family income is over 55000 a year, you are in the top 10% of the rich people in the world. I don't care how you slice it. If you're in the top 10%, like you are rich. We might not be rich when we compare ourselves to the insanely, like unfathomably rich of our country. But if it's a, over $55,000 a year that your household's bringing in, you are in the top 10% in the world. Like, we are blessed people. We have been given so much, and we've created a world for ourselves where we can remove ourselves from the need of others, from their suffering, from their hurting, from their brokenness. Like, what happens? In, in wealthy communities, they make all these rules to keep poor people out. If poor people start moving into your area, like, people with money leave because they don't even want to be around poor people because they don't want to be confronted with the need that other people have. That's what the disciples are doing. Like, Jesus, like, now these people are all needy. Let's get rid of them. Like, let's send them to someone else to take care of it. When we see the crowds or when we see the poor, we can see it as an obstacle that has to be removed so that we can continue to enjoy the good life that we have. But Jesus saw the crowd and the needs of the people as an opportunity to express the heart of God and the culture of the kingdom of God. He was filled with compassion for them. Now, every single person on the face of this earth is full of infinite worth and value. Jesus loves every single one of us the same. Jesus came to save each and every one of us from our sins, to free us from bondage and from slavery. He came to free us all from oppression. He came to mend the broken pieces of our heart. This is what Jesus came to do because of his great love for us. Jesus 
when he saw the needs of the 5,000 who were hungry, it was because of the compassion that he had for them that it led him to the place of where he had to act. He couldn't accept that this was reality, that this would continue. Like for us with 4DLC, it has to be like we cannot accept the fact that there are kids who are going to school in snow wearing flip-flops and capris. Our hearts have to be filled with so much compassion that when we see that need, instead of trying to remove it from ourselves and get it out of our view or pass them on to someone else, it has to move us to this place of where we take on responsibility. The disciples, they just wanted to like pass on responsibility to someone else. That's not my responsibility. I take care of my family. You know, like I got to think about myself and all these things. Like send these people somewhere else. Like Jesus, surely you don't expect us to spend our money. Like my money, I worked hard for it. I pay taxes. Like they didn't want to have to use what they had to be able to meet the needs of other people. But Jesus says, you feed them. Jesus doesn't say, you know, give them some Google map coordinates to where they can go to a shelter or where they can get some food. He doesn't say pass them on to some government agency. What Jesus says is that when he is confronted by the needs of his people and his heart is filled with compassion, he says, you feed them. Jesus is taking responsibility and Jesus is also assigning responsibility to his church. So the apostles, his disciples, it was setting the model that as followers of Jesus Christ, we don't just pass on the needs of others to someone else. When we see the need, we recognize that Jesus has given us the assignment, he's given us the responsibility to take up that need ourselves so that we can meet it to the best of our abilities. When we see need, Jesus is saying, you feed them. When we see kids that don't have winter clothing, Jesus is saying, you clothe them. Whatever the need is that you're confronted with in your own situation. Jesus is calling us as his people, as the church, to be those who demonstrate the heart of God to them and meet the need. And then number three is freely give what isn't enough. The disciples, they say, like, Jesus, all we have is five loaves and two fish. 5,000 people there, the only food that anybody brought was five loaves of bread and two fish. And it was one little boy whose mama packed him lunch. He probably wasn't even there for Jesus. He's just all like playing around. And in the crowd, they find one kid who has five loaves and two fish. That's all that this kid has. That's all that the entire 5,000 people have. And so when they scrounge up all the resources that they have and they bring it to Jesus, the disciples are like, see, Jesus, we can't do it. Like, this is stupid. How on earth are we? This is even insulting. Hey, guys, let me see what we can do. Oh, don't worry, we got this. Uh, okay, we have to cut these slices really thin. Who here is vegan? Because we're going to make these fish go a long ways. All they had was, for 5,000 people, was five loaves and two fish. I think most of us would quit at that point. Uh, that's what the disciples want to do. They're trying to get out of it. Look, Jesus, we don't have enough. We tried, but this is all the resources that we could scrounge up. I mean, what Jesus is doing is he's wanting us to freely give what isn't enough. Uh, my wife and I, as we're praying about what it is that we're going to give for the Big Give offering, we recognize that the need is so great that even if we cleared our accounts, we can't meet the needs for all of these kids. Not even close in laughably far away from being able to meet all of the needs. But Jesus didn't say, go out and round up enough for 5,000 people. He said, you feed them. He said, gather what is it that you have. Gather everything you've got. Let's bring it all in together. Let's put it all in the center. And then what Jesus does is he miraculously blesses it. You don't have to have enough. You don't have to understand how it's all going to work. What you have to do is to freely give what it is that you do have, recognizing that it's not enough, but knowing that Jesus miraculously blesses everything that we give to him. Everything that I hold on to, for the most part, like it, it's, it is what it is. And it's only going to do what it can do in its natural element. But everything that I give to Jesus, he supernaturally blesses so that it can accomplish more than it ever should have been able to accomplish. And that's the story right here, is that when they brought everything they had, when they finally decided to accept responsibility for meeting the needs, for feeding the people that Jesus called them to, they freely gave what little it was that they had, but it was everything they had. Jesus took what was given 
and he supernaturally blessed it so that it could feed every single person that was there. This is a miracle, like miracle upon miracle. Walking on water, that's pretty cool. This is cooler. Like healing sick people, that's pretty awesome. Feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish it seems like a whole nother level of the miraculous. Like that is insane what Jesus is able to do when we freely give what isn't enough. And I love that there's 12 baskets left over. You see, there's more left over than they had than what they started with. When Jesus was blessing something, it wasn't just that they were able to barely meet the needs of all the people. They had more left over than what they started with. And the reason that there were 12 baskets left over, that's actually very significant to the Jewish people who were there who were witnessing this miracle. Because at the time, uh, they all knew they were Jewish people. They knew there were 12 tribes in Israel, that there were 12 families that were a part of the family of God that he had adopted as his own people. So what God was doing was he was showing them is that when he blesses what it is that we give to him, there, it's not that it just barely meets the needs, but what God blesses makes us that there's enough for the entire family of God to be cared for. It wasn't just that there's barely enough left over. God, there's so much in the kingdom of God. And when he blesses something, there's no scarcity mentality. When God blesses something, there's enough for the entire family of God. And we live in a day where the family of God has been expanded beyond the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm so grateful that I've been grafted into this family. I was adopted into the family. And there's enough for me in this family. And there's enough for you in this family. And there's enough for all the people of God. And not just enough, but more than enough. We have to get rid of a scarcity mentality. There's no scarcity in the kingdom. There's scarcity in our hearts, but there's not scarcity in the kingdom. When Jesus blesses something, it's always more than enough. It doesn't, you don't understand how this could possibly happen. You don't see the way it's going to work, but when we give it to Jesus, there's always more than enough. And I think this spoke to every single person that was there, and I think it really spoke to the disciples. Because what the disciples learned, probably even more than the 5,000, because the 5,000 weren't in on this whole conversation of like, well, how are we going to get this? Like, what are we going to do? How are we gonna, uh, Jesus, we can't send them away. Like, you mute your mic. God, send them away. Get all these people, they're horrible people. Get rid of them. They didn't know that was going on. So the disciples saw when they gave everything they had, which wasn't enough, Jesus blessed it, and then there was more than enough for everyone. The disciples needed to learn that lesson. Because the scarcity mentality infects our hearts so much. God, if I give everything that I have, then there's not going to be enough for me. God provides for you. Every single time. Like it's become a running joke for Anna and I. And I was like, every time there's an offer, like, well, let's clear out the count again. Like, we, we should probably be saving more for the future. I'm not against saving for the future. Like, you need to be smart. But when God directs you to give, you give what it is that God directs you to give. And you never have to be afraid because he always provides. He's the God of more than enough. And it's what we have to understand, too, is the whole reason why you have money and the, the resources that we have, the whole reason that you are you know, living in this country and living the good life that you live with all of the provision that you have isn't so that you can just live a good life in this country with lots of material wealth and enjoying the finer things of life. That is not why God puts you in the top 10% of the wealthy people in the world. When you go all the way back to Abraham and the founding of our faith, God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to all the nations. God has blessed you with the resources, with the gifts, with the talents, with the time, with the money that you have, not for you. He did it so that you can be a blessing to those who are around you. See, every single one of us, there's a call on our lives to proclaim and to demonstrate the kingdom of God. Every single one of us has been called to feed them. Every single one of us has been called to, to clothe them. That's the call that every single one of us has if we are a follower of Jesus. If we want our life to look like the life of Jesus, then we have to do the things that Jesus did. And we get excited when it's about healing people or words for people and not as excited when it's about giving everything that we have to meet the needs of others people. But that's the full gospel. 
That's the full demonstration. That's the full living out and modeling what it means to understand the heart of the Father and to express the heart of the Father to people that are around us. I don't want to live my life having to be my own provision. I recognize the reason that I'm rich is because of the time and the place that I was born in. You put me here, even 100 years ago, 40% of your income would have gone to putting food on your table. 115 years ago, the average male lived to be 42 years old because life was hard. There were very, very few wealthy people. When you look across the world, you put yourself 100, 200 years ago, you would not be enjoying the life and the wealth that you have now. It is a product of the time in which God has placed you. And he's placed you in this time and he's given you the resources that you have for the proclamation and the demonstration of the gospel. But we want to hold on to it. We want to use it for ourselves. And like the disciples, we want to send the needs and the problems of those around us that God has called us to onto someone else. But that's not the heart of the Father. This is the heart of the Father. In Psalm 146, 7 through 9, it says he gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigner among us. He cares for the orphans and the widows, but he frustrates the plans of the wicked. There's no political party on this earth that lives that passage out. Only the people of God do. And we can only do that by the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us transforming our hearts so that instead of seeing how much we can hold on to and how much we can accumulate for ourselves, we start evaluating our life and saying, how much of this can I give away so that Jesus can be glorified? How much of what I have can I give away? How much can I cut out of my budget that I'm using for myself so that I can meet the needs of other people? How can I be a good steward of everything God's given me, my time, my talents, my resources, my money? How can I use everything that God has given me so that I can proclaim and so that I can demonstrate the heart of God, so I can demonstrate the gospel to all of those who are around me? See, if we want to live this out, we must be a people who are moved by compassion. At 40 LC, I believe that God has strategically aligned us with them. We were trying to get involved with the school for years and just shut door after shut door. Nobody wanted anything to do with us because they all just thought we wanted to go in there and, and preach Jesus to them. They didn't understand. We just wanted to be Jesus to them. They might say we can't preach Jesus. That's all right. We'll be Jesus and allow our life to do the preaching. And then God opened a door at 40 LC. Start out with just getting some school supplies for a classroom for one teacher and some food to send home with the kids because they were hungry. And then another teacher saw that. Where do you get that? Oh, Radiant Church. Can they do that for me? Oh, we can ask. He said, yeah. And then we did it for more teachers there and more teachers there. And then the social worker found out. And the social worker said, can you do more of this? I have these needs. Yeah, we'll buy more clothes. We'll buy more food. We'll, we'll keep doing this. God, thank you for the open door and the opportunity that we have. And then it turned into buying Christmas gifts because there's so many families that couldn't give any gifts to their children. And so we remember from the last few years when buying gifts, so we give to the parents and the parents get to take them home and wrap them and put tags on them and give them to their kids themselves. And this summer, going there and a little work project of fixing up the school and doing a lot of work in the courtyard and, and just creating a place for the kids and showing them how valuable and how much we love them. And now God's opened the door for us to do this. We see a need. These kids are cold. They're going to school without winter clothing. They're going to school hungry. I believe that breaks the heart of God. That's not the way God created this world to be. It's not the way things will be when Jesus returns. It's not the way it is in heaven. There are no hungry kids. There are no cold kids in heaven. And Jesus taught us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have to be moved with compassion. Jesus, this isn't right. Every one of these kids is filled with worth, incomparable value. Every one of these kids is worth more than the sum of all of my possessions. Every one of these kids is worth more than every dollar I have. 
every one of these kids is worth more than the sum of all of our possessions and money as an entire church. Every single one of them is worth more. Every single one of these kids is worth just as much as my own kids. I would never let my kids go to school without winter clothing. I don't care what I had to sell, what I had to sacrifice. I do everything in my power. But my kids aren't worth any more than theirs, so why should I accept that other kids are doing that? It's not how Jesus sees the world. Every one of these kids deserves better. Every one of these kids Jesus has called us to. We have to have compassion in our heart that's stirred up first so we don't just overlook a problem or try to avoid a problem, but that we see it squarely in our hearts or broken by it and moved with compassion and makes us so that we take on this responsibility. Jesus is telling us, feed them. You feed them. Jesus is telling us, you clothe them. See, Jesus made us partners in this ministry of reconciliation. He made us partners in the gospel. He's called us to proclaim it and to demonstrate it. We can't just do it when it's easy. Our words are cheap. It's easy to proclaim it, and it's so important, don't get me wrong, but there also has to be this part of where we're sacrificially giving so that we can demonstrate the heart of God, just like Jesus sacrificially gave of himself in every way possible to demonstrate the culture of the kingdom and the heart of the Father towards us. We can't run away from the responsibility. We have to recognize that this is our calling as the church. It's what it means to follow after Jesus. This is the full gospel. We have to freely give what, wasn't, what isn't enough. I know that I myself cannot meet all of the need. No matter how much I want to, none of us in this church ourselves could meet the full need. But what Jesus is calling us to do is to freely give what isn't enough to meet that need. And then trust that he is going to supernaturally bless it and make it go beyond what it should. You know what my prayer is? Like, that $20,000 goal was too small. I really realize that now. We can give more than that. They need boots, and if that's all we get, like we're going to buy boots and it'll be awesome. But they need more than boots. And so my prayer is that as we all give towards this, that God takes what isn't enough, he blesses it, and that when we leave that place, it's not just that every kid's able to barely get what they need. I pray that there are storehouses in that school that are filled with the leftovers of what we have. So as needs continue to arise, they're able to not have to come to us and try to get it. We have it ready to go for them, for all God's people, for this huge, beautiful family that he's calling us all into. No cold kids. No hungry kids. Not in our city. Not when we have the money that we have. Not when we have the life that we have. Not when God has positioned us and opened up this door for us. There should be no cold kids and no hungry court kids at Ford ELC. Jesus is calling us to meet this need. Will you join me in that? Will you stand with me? So next week... We're going to have the offering at the end of our service. But here's what I want you to do this week. I want you to, to pray and to seek God for what it is that he wants you to give, and it'll be different for every single one of us. We're all stewards. Nothing I have is really mine. Everything I have is something God's entrusted me with and something that I give account for someday, and he's able to tell me what he wants to do with that money at any given time. Like my Edward Jones person, if they just decided they were going to take all my money and they were going to go and buy whatever they wanted for themselves, I would not be happy. I would fire them. They are a steward of my money. It's my money. I'm entrusting them to invest it for me and they better bear a return on it or they're going to get fired. And I won't give them any more money. We're stewards of everything. Everything God's given us at any time, he has the ability to speak into our lives and say, I want you to use X amount to give it here. I want you to give this possession to so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. I want you to be a good steward of everything that I give you and do the best you can to bring a return on it and use it wisely. But there will be times when God says, oh, by the way, I'm going to make this move right now. This is what I want you to do. And we have to do that if we really have submitted ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus. It's not always easy because we get a hold of money and we start thinking it's ours. But it's not. 
God has entrusted it to us. We are stewards of it. He expects a return on it according to his plans and his purposes and for the things that are on his heart. I believe kids are on the heart of God. So Jesus, I pray over every single one of our hearts. God, that there would be compassion that's stirred up inside of us. God, I don't want anybody to hear this and to feel guilty into giving. That's not the way you work. But I pray the Holy Spirit would stir up generosity and compassion inside of every one of us. That would make us so like our own kids. That there would be a delight and a joy that we experience in meeting the needs of our own children and providing for them. Jesus, I pray that there would be sacrificial generosity that's stirred up inside of every one of us, just like you demonstrated when you were walking this earth and the way that you gave even your own life for us to bring provision for us and the things that we couldn't have. God, you met the fullness of our needs on the cross. And so, Jesus, as we live like you, as we're reshaped and remodeled into your likeness and your image on the face of this earth, will that same kind of sacrificial generosity be stirred up inside of us? God, I pray that you would speak to every person what it is that you would have them give for this offering. And Jesus says, we give what isn't enough. I pray that you would supernaturally bless it, that it would go beyond what it should do, that there would be more than enough, that there would be leftover for all of these kids. Jesus, I pray that you would receive glory and praise and adoration through this. God, I pray that you would use this demonstration of your heart to lead others to a place of putting their faith in you as they see how beautiful you are, how concerned you are with everything that you, everything they do. And Jesus, us, even if they didn't. God, I pray that still we would sacrifice for them out of the love that we have for them, just in the way that you sacrifice for us, even when we turn our back on you. Reshape our hearts, God. Fill them with passion. God, reshape the way that we view this world, that we would take on responsibility for meeting the needs of those who are around us. God, help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to demonstrate the gospel. In the heart of our Father, in the name of Jesus we pray, amen, amen. Well, I'm going to call my prayer partners forward. They'll be in the front on the outside here. If there's anything that we can pray with you about, we would love to pray with you. Be praying this week about what it is you would give. And then uh, also, um, if any of you can sign up to be hands and feet there on the ground, that would be awesome. We need some help with the setup and the teardown before and after. We need some people that can go there and help kids find clothing and boots that fit them and, and develop some relationships with them and make them feel valued and special. You can sign up for all that at RadiantA2.com under the events page or some people at Guest Central as you're leaving can help you uh, figure that out. But let's make this a big give. Let's make Jesus, let's show people how big our God is and how great and how big his heart and how big the gospel is. God bless. We'll see you next week.